Getting into the Pokemon trading card game is easier than ever before, but with dozens of products, multiple formats, and thousands of cards to choose from, where do you start? If you're building on a budget, then there's always the trusty theme deck. With a bit of cash and a lot of creativity, you can build something bold and battle ready. You're watching Deck Boss. Hi everyone, and welcome to Deck Boss, the show where we take classic theme decks and give them a competitive tune-up. This week, we're going to try and supercharge the Twilight Rogue theme deck from Forbidden Light. The Twilight Rogue is an interesting theme deck that leans very heavily into the idea of being outnumbered. With that concise theme in mind, an average deck boss and a solid lineup of staple cards, it's actually a pretty nice package for anyone just getting into the game. Now. Let's crack this open and meet our deck boss. The Twilight Rogue theme deck is built around Lycan Rock. This rock solid lupine is a stage one Pokemon with two attacks. Its first attack, Dangerous Rogue, costs one fighting energy and one colorless energy, and does 20 damage base plus 20 more for each of the opponent's benched Pokemon. Its second attack, Excel Rock, costs two fighting energy and one colorless energy and does 100 damage. As far as deck bosses go, Lycanroc is an interesting, but fairly average pick. It's a stage one, so it's quick enough to get into play. Dangerous Rogue can have good damage output for cost, and Lycanroc can apply some light bench control through its presence. But there are some notable drawbacks here too. Acceleroc does pitiful damage for what it costs, Lycanroc is pretty squishy at only 120 HP, and a smart opponent can easily cap Dangerous Rogue's damage, which isn't really much to begin with. So to make Lycanroc work, we've basically got to buff the base damage of Dangerous Rogue while forcing the opponent to bench multiple Pokemon in order to get the most out of its multiplier mechanic. If we can do that, and maybe back up Lycanroc when the enemy bench is tight, then it can, in theory, make for one Dangerous Doggo. Now, let's jump back into the theme deck and see what it gives us to work with. Twilight Rogue comes with a really nice set of cards constructed around the idea of forcing things onto the bench and leveraging that for damage. Your main engine in forcing things down is Dusk Noir, which lets you check your opponent's hand once per turn and forcefully put something onto the bench. It's nice, but as a stage two, with a pretty expensive attack, its use is dubious at best. You get Malamar for a bit of energy acceleration, which does help to fulfill the mid to expensive attack costs in our lineup, but given the conflict between using Psychic and Fighting Energy, mm, it's a toss up on whether it works here specifically. And you get Zalazzle to help you search out key cards when needed, but needing to evolve, attach, and attack to search out those cards is asking a bit much. You get some decent draw support in Cynthia, Lily, and Professor Kakui, which are always the best you can ask for in a Sun and Moon theme deck. Your Pokeball package consists of Nest Ball and Timer Ball, which is pretty passable for a theme deck like this, although an Ultra Ball is always nice. Brooklet Hill gives you an additional out to your basics, basically acting as a Nest Ball every turn for your fighting or non-existent water types, which is always nice. Weakness Policy can remove weakness, but on pretty soft one prizers like the ones included in this deck, its mileage is going to be pretty limited. Rescue Stretcher is there, as always, for some recovery in a pinch, especially nice given the multiple evolution lines we run in this deck. And you get quite a mobility package with Switch, Escape Rope, and Escape Board. Since this deck runs on a light Malamar engine, this is actually a really nice touch to see in a deck list. And as for the rest, don't worry about it. I really like this theme deck conceptually, and I think that in a more casual setting, it's definitely worth taking for a spin. I am a little worried because it's not the fastest list out there, and Lycan Rock isn't the hardest hitting deck boss ever, but there are so many possibilities here that I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. I would say yeah, definitely grab a copy or two if you see it on the shelf, but of course, singles are always a thing, so you do you. And now that we've got the basics, let's jump on over to PTCGO to see how we can make this deck work. Okay. So as much as I really wanted to take the whole dual psychic fighting thing and make it work, the world is just too fast and scary of a place for that kind of deck to work now. 
Instead, I reached back into the middle chunk of the Sun and Moon era for some inspiration and found that the leap to a fairly successful archetype wasn't too big. So what I ended up doing was transform our Wii Twilight Rogue theme deck into a Buzzwole Lucario Lycanroc deck, which is exactly what it sounds like. The general idea of the deck really is just to evolve at the right moment, to either set up a gust or deal a concentrated blow, and when you're not doing that, you use Buzzwole to spread damage around the board. Speaking of which, first up is the Swole Skeeto himself, Buzzwole GX. It's a big basic with the ability to spread damage around with Jet Punch, and for that reason alone, it's a fantastic card. Thanks to the numerous damage modifiers available in this deck, Buzzwole can chunk things while setting up key KOs on the bench. It also has two beefy attacks that allow you to blow things out when necessary, so that's always nice. Lucario GX is our dedicated striker, and the main reason we run it is the Aura Strike attack, which does 120 damage for one fighting energy if used on the turn it evolves. It's great value, and even sets up an easy KO on some V-Maxes when used with certain damage modifiers. Its GX attack is also fantastic, allowing you to retaliate for huge damage if your opponent fails to KO it, which isn't out of the question given its solid 210 HP. Our Lycanroc GX of choice is the Midnight Form, which has the ability Bloodthirsty Eyes. It essentially allows you to gust something up on the turn that you evolve into it, which is critical when you pair it alongside things like Aura Strike, for example. Dangerous Rogue is also a nice GX attack, letting you punish the opponent for benching too many Pokemon, kinda like our actual deck boss. Regirock EX and Diancy Prism Star are here to act as bench-sitting damage modifiers, increasing the damage output of our fighting-type attackers by 10 and 20, respectively. These two can really help edge out some key KOs, but they can also be bricks in the early game, especially if they get stuck in the active, so that's something to be mindful of. Octillery is there to provide us with a bit more draw power, and it's easily set up because Remoraid can actually be fetched with Brooklet Hill. It also prevents an easy defeat at the hands of things like Marnie and N, which is a welcome bonus, especially in a more combo-oriented deck like this one. And Tapu Lele GX is there to fetch some key supporters when the moment calls for it. Speaking of supporters, our draw supporter lineup is actually pretty stacked. We're running Cynthia, Lily, and N in decent counts because boy do you need to see cards all the time, and even with the Versus Seekers thrown in here, my draw supporter luck is just shite, <laughs> so uh, I've kept the count a little higher to just make sure we always have access to those extra cards. Guzma provides some much needed gusting, allowing you to pivot around and steal key KOs, or just shuffle the board around when a brick like Wretched Rock gets stuck in the active. And Acerola is there to basically let us cycle our attackers like Lucario GX, or to get more than one use out of Bloodthirsty Eyes. It's also just really handy for getting a heavily damaged attacker out of the way, and denying your opponent a couple of prizes, which can be really helpful in a pinch. Versus Seeker is of course here to help reuse our supporters, particularly Guzma and Acerola given their low physical counts. I think this card is best saved for later in the game in a deck like this when your resources are starting to get a bit depleted, but hey, you roll with the situations as they come up. Nest Ball and Ultra Ball fill our search needs pretty well. In this particular case, I felt the full 4-4 split wasn't really necessary, because Brooklet Hill kind of helps you sort out your need for basics anyways, essentially acting as an extra Nest Ball every turn. Brooklet Hill, speaking of which, searches out our basic fighting and water Pokemon, allowing us to bench one from the deck every turn, which does ensure that our bench is always loaded with evolving goodies, or maybe it helps us net that Diancy or Regirock that we need to secure a key KO. Ordinary Rod allows for some recovery in a pinch, putting back a few evolution lines and energy as required. Muscle Band is there to give a blanket buff to our damage, and while 20 might not seem like a lot, it can really help in turning a lot of 2 or 3 hit KOs into 1 hit KOs or 2 hit KOs, which is really nice. Floatstone provides some much needed mobility, especially for our vulnerable bench sitters like Regirock or Tapu Lele. We run a playset of Strong Energy, which basically acts as a muscle band when attached to a fighting type Pokemon. This, combined with our other damage modifiers, can turn things like Jet Punch and Aura Strike 
into really big sledgehammers. So this is a resource that should be used carefully and with great consideration. And we play a decent count of six fighting energy because, well, you need some basic energy in a list like this. And that's the deck. It's pretty serviceable, and while it doesn't necessarily play to Lycanroc's strengths, I do think it makes up for most of its shortcomings. Now, as much as I experimented and tried more one prizer focused decks, believe me, uh, I tried about 13 different lists, at the end of the day, I realized that you just need the extra muscle to help take on the monsters lurking in the expanded ladder now. Dangerous Rogue, coming from our baby Lycanroc, even with a fully loaded bench, just doesn't do that much to something like a Reshiram and Charizard Tag Team GX. And, you know, looking at the overall structure of the deck, I figured this is an archetype that did pretty well in the good old days, even, you know, at the dawn of tag teams. So why not take it for a spin here and see if it can give our wee doggo a helping hand? And with that, let's let slip the dogs of war as we crash into the expanded ladder.
Oh, how best to describe Lycan Rock and Twilight Rogue. I think the best way to put it would be lots of promise, little to show for it. Now, I'm not going to lie, I was super intrigued by this card, and I really thought I could make some cool multiple type decks like Buzzwool, Weavall, Garboder, you know, Passimi and Tabu Coco. I was really hoping I could make one of these really teched out, interesting lists, maybe even leveraging the actual Malamar engine that comes with the theme deck. But alas, uh, Lycan Rock being the card it is, it just doesn't compare to something like a Baby Buzzwool or a Weavile, for example. Lycan Rock as an idea is great. Punishing your opponent for benching a lot of Pokemon is fantastic, especially in an age of things like Eternatus VMAX. But in execution, it's just too little damage for the investment. If Dangerous Rogue maybe had a slightly higher base damage, or if the multiplier was 10 more for each bench Pokemon, then I think we'd have a much better card here, but as it stands, you can fail to KO Baby Basics which is really saying something about a stage one Pokemon that takes two energy to attack. Even in the match that I featured against an Eternatus list, it was just too risky to spend the attachment on the baby Lycanroc because it was going to get easily KO'd, and I didn't think I was really going to get the mileage out of it. Evolving into Lycanroc GX actually seemed like the better route, especially because the GX attack actually offered the massive damage potential to take advantage of the fact that my opponent was benching a lot of stuff, and paired with the gust effect, it was just too good to turn up. Now, I actually think this is mostly just a case of time being unkind to a card. Lycanroc actually saw minor play and success in a number of Buzzwool and Zoroark decks alongside the GX Lycanrocs. In an era dominated by Zoroark GX in particular, Lycanroc could punish somebody going for a big riotous beating or just benching a ton of draw support Pokemon or something like that. Or it could just take a massive chunk out of Buzzwool or Golisopod, for example. But with HP routinely soaring from 240 to 340, the doggo's bite is like being tickled instead of being mauled. Now for the record, I do think this is a good card. Maybe just in concept, uh, or at the very least in its own time, which is the first couple of months to a year after the theme deck itself was released. I love the card, I really do, and I'd love to have another go at it someday. I actually think I made more draft decks for this than any other deck boss to date, and that's including deck bosses that were good, or ones that really required me to go out to left field in order to make a workable list. And I spent so much time drafting those deck lists because I thought this card presented a lot of interesting opportunities. It could be paired with a lot of interesting stuff. The theme deck itself said, hey, we're going to give you a Malamar engine alongside some fighting types with an interesting mechanic. There was a lot I thought I could work with, but I think that strategy and that promise, it's really not worth much outside of the golden era of the sun and moon block. And with another deck boss done, it's time to look at what's coming up next. I am still keen on trying some fun expanded deck lists, Maybe, yes, caving a little bit and playing with some tag teams and VMAXs. But I think first I'll take a crack at something a little more recent for the next episode of Deck Boss. Or, hey, uh, maybe I'll jump the gun a little bit and uh, dive into what we could maybe do with the recently announced uh, V Battle decks from Evolving Skies, which also show a lot of promise and have me very, very keen after a very grindy couple weeks trying to make this uh, particular episode. I don't know, but whatever the episode ends up being, um, I think I'll definitely be taking some big hitters for a spin in order to avoid the grind that has been the making of this and the last episode of Deck Boss. And anyway, as for the rest, you know the drill. If you enjoyed the show, like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Your encouragement is what keeps the show running, or at the very least, it propels the many poor financial decisions that make sure I always have some new decks to crack. So, hey, keep that encouragement coming, guys. And with that, I will leave you all to it. Enjoy what's left of your week or weekend, and until next time, take it easy.